I've been using the Fuji X-Series cameras for a little bit over two years now, and one of the questions that I get loads in my emails is about switching from full-frame Nikon to Fuji, and it's also a comment that appeared loads in my last review of the Fuji X-T2. And two years after I first published a blog about switching from, from Nikon to Fuji, it's probably still one of the most popularly read blogs on my website, so I figured that it was about time that I made a video about why I switched from full-frame Nikon to Fuji. Now I'm a landscape and travel photographer. I've been shooting digital for about 11 years. My first camera was a Nikon D80 and uh, right since the very beginning, I've loved shooting landscapes, I've loved shooting waterscapes. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough to travel a lot and wherever I go I shoot and I'm lucky enough to be able to do this for a living and, and lead workshops and shoot professionally. So like a lot of photographers, I moved up from crop sensors up to full frame. My first full frame camera was a Nikon D3. Back then I used to shoot a lot of weddings professionally as well, so I really appreciated the speed. And then I moved up to a Nikon D800, which is a beautiful camera. I won't say a bad word about Nikon cameras, well, apart from the fact that they're quite big and heavy, but they make beautiful images. And some of my favorite images I've ever taken were with the Nikon D800E. It's a wonderful, wonderful camera. So what I don't want to do is be particularly critical of a camera brand or say this camera's not as good as that camera or this camera's better, because that's not what it's about. Everyone makes great cameras nowadays. There aren't really many bad cameras. If you're making a bad camera, you probably go out of business. We are so lucky now in photography to be blessed with such a choice of incredible image making machines. So it's not about this being better than that. What it's about is finding a particular camera or finding a camera brand that works really well for you, that you really enjoy using because there's always an emotional element about it. And also something that fits the needs that you have in your particular shooting style. So for me personally, that's the Fuji X series. And what I want to talk about is why that camera brand and why that particular camera, the X-T1 and the X-T2 works so well for me and what I do. So the first time I came into contact with the Fuji X series cameras was when I was using Nikon and running street workshops and a couple of clients came along with X-T1 or an X-Pro1 and I started to notice these cameras and noticed how incredibly, first of all, they're beautiful machines, but I was also impressed by how tactile they were, the usability. I liked the fact that you could control everything through dials on the top. It was something that, that just looked really great uh, and sort of piqued my curiosity to the point where I invested in an X-T10 because I thought it might make a nice backup camera or a travel camera to take with me when I was traveling. Now, as I said before, I travel quite a lot, which means taking cameras and lenses on planes and tripods and stuff like that. Uh, and I also hike a lot. I do a lot of long treks, this kind of thing, with the camera on my back. Uh, and really, I was just getting a little bit tired of the Nikon gear because it's a very, it gave me a very heavy kit. Now, I'd scaled down from a D3 with, with a 70 to 200 f2.8 to a smaller D800 and the f4 lenses, but I was still finding them quite heavy. They were still bulky. So the idea of moving to a smaller system was something that intrigued me, but I wasn't really ready to, to just pull the bullet and switch from one system to another just like that. So what I did was I took the Fuji system with me on a three week trip to Indonesia. And by the time that I got back, I'd shot landscapes, I'd shot people, and I hadn't missed the Nikon camera at all. There were certain shots there, like this two hour star trail, which was done with an X-T1 that I thought that I simply wouldn't be able to achieve with a Fuji camera. And when I could do that kind of stuff, it made me realize that I quite simply didn't need a big full frame camera anymore. And on top of that is the fact that I genuinely appreciated carrying around a much smaller, much lighter camera system. So just how important is it to have a smaller, lighter system? Well, I tended to travel light anyway. I only ever really used to use two lenses, an ultra wide angle zoom with the Nikon, I was using the 16 to 35 f4. Before that, it was a 17 to 35 f2.8. Uh, and I used a 70 to 200 telephoto f4. Before that, I was using the f2.8 version. So when I switched to Fuji, my I got basically like for like replacements. So I was using the 10 to 24 ultra wide angle and the 55 to 200 telephoto. Now Fuji do a faster telephoto. There's a 50 to 140 millimeter, but it's an f2.8 lens. So it's big and heavy, so it's pretty much much the same as a full frame lens. 
Uh, and what I wanted to do was travel as light as possible. And just in that, the Fuji body, the two lenses, I was saving about one kilogram. Principal reason behind that is, is while there's not a huge amount of difference with bodies, certainly if you're using Sony, the Sony mirrorless bodies are also quite lighter. But when you're using full frame, there's obviously going to be a lot more glass in there. So the big difference is always in the lenses. And of course, the more stuff you carry, the bigger the difference in weight is. So if you need to take an extra body, a backup body in case one fails, if you want to take a speciality lens to shoot stars or you want to take a couple of really fast portrait lenses, then the difference gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's also secondary payoffs with the weight difference is that using a smaller camera means you can use a smaller lighter tripod. It means you can use a smaller lighter camera bag. So the knock-on effects are actually quite significant. And I found that when I was traveling, I was on average being, used, being about two and a half to three kilos less with my camera equipment than I was when I was using full frame. And that's a huge difference. That's my tent, my sleeping bag, and most of my clothes. That's three liters of water. It's a big, big difference. And something that I really can't ignore, and I'm not quite sure I could go back to shooting a big full frame camera again. A few months ago, I, I got to borrow the Fuji GFX, which is a very big camera with really huge lenses. That's a lovely camera. It takes fantastic images. But by the time I finished using it, I was traveling, I had it for about a week. I was quite happy to give it back. I'm just not really interested in using a camera that big, that heavy again. It makes a difference when you're hiking, if you've got every, any, everything on your back. It makes you more likely to go further, to climb that peak, to go up there, because you've, it's, you're just simply less tired. It makes a difference when you're street shooting, you've got everything slung over your shoulder in a bag, and you spend the entire day on the streets with the camera, a couple of lenses shooting. It just means that you're less fatigued, it means that you're sharper, it means that you're more likely to see things, more likely to be out on the street shooting. And that for me is much more important than having a few more megapixels or having full frame. But obviously this makes no sense unless the image quality is good. There's no point having a lighter camera if the image quality is going to suffer. Otherwise you just carry your phone. What's the point in scaling down and being lighter and having a smaller kit, having a smaller backpack if the images are going to suck or if you're not going to be happy with the image quality. So here's where we have to be really honest with ourselves about how many megapixels we actually need for the kind of photography that we're doing. Now, if you're shooting billboards, if you regularly need to print more than a meter wide, if you often find yourself having to crop half of the image off because you just want to use a little bit in the middle that you've shot, then probably you need a high megapixel camera, something like the Canon 5DR or the new Nikon D850 or, or, or medium format. But those aren't my purposes for shooting. The biggest prints that I ever sell to clients are about 50 or 60 centimeters wide. And this print behind me, that's a 50 centimeter print done with a 12 megapixel camera. So most of the printing that I do ends up in magazines and you can easily print a double page spread with a crop sensor camera. Now I showed this before in the last video, but I'll show it again now. This is a double page spread shot with a crop sensor Nikon D90. It's a 12 megapixel camera. You can see here, this is a single full page spread. This is shot with a 60 megapixel Fuji X-T1. And you can see here, this is a, it's, it's spread a little bit across both pages. And this is a 36 megapixel full frame Nikon D800. Now, I guarantee you, I promise you that when you look at the page, you simply cannot see the difference between those three cameras. There's none at all to the naked eye. Unless you're printing really big, unless you're printing billboards, you're not gonna notice the megapixel difference in real terms. When you zoom in to 100% on your screen, you probably are. You're gonna see that, you're gonna think, oh, I've got so much detail here. But in reality, how much do you need to do that? It's something that's simply not necessary in most practical applications of photography. And I don't spend my time shooting test sheets, test charts, things like that, measuring the, the resolution. What I care about is that my prints, the prints for the purpose that I need them for, look good. And for me, the Fuji X series with a really good sharp lens is gonna give me certainly the kind of image quality that I need for that kind of work. Now, one of the things that I did when I first got my Fuji X-T1 was a side-by-side -side comparison with the Nikon D800 and the Fuji X-T1. Now, I wasn't really interested in measuring absolute resolution or detail because that's not what's practical to my shooting. What I wanted to see was that when I shot them in similar situations, set up in the same way that I would shoot a landscape scene, so the camera on a tripod, shooting at f8, shutter release, um, was how big a difference it was and was there a significant difference. Now significant difference can mean different things to different people and how what it means for me is that if the difference between the two camera systems was so noticeable that it was immediately apparent to me that this camera was not as good as this camera, that the image quality from one camera was not as good as the other. 
that was what I was interested in, but I was also interested in the level of detail that I was getting from the system. Now, it's important to remember that detail is not always the same as resolution. Resolution is how many pixels they are, which interprets how big you can print it or how much you can crop into it. It's not necessarily the same as detail because if you've got loads of megapixels, but the lenses that you're using are not very good and they're not resolving that detail, then you're not going to get all the detail that the camera is capable of resolving. So what I wanted to see was that the camera system that I was using with the lenses that I had, how much detail that I was going to have. And detail matters at every level of the image, whether you're, show whether you're just showing it at 2000 pixels wide for your website, Site, whether it's at 600 pixels wide for an Instagram post or whether it's 50 centimeters wide for print you're going to notice the detail more than you notice the resolution okay so this is an image shot with a wide angle on the left you've got the Fuji shot with the 10 millimeter and then on the right you've got the Nikon shot with the 60 millimeter now they're both shot at f8 at the, little, at the base ISO let's just zoom in a little bit uh, to have a look at the absolute detail starting off first in the corners. We'll zoom in a little bit more at 200% now. Uh, now, I've de resed the Nikon to make the resolution the same because otherwise you'd get a difference in size. But what I say, what I'm looking here at detailing is that when we look around like at this plant here or when we look down, we go down to the bottom left corner to look at the sign or we'll look here or over here at the cables, you'll notice it's actually a little bit more detail in the Fuji image. So even if the Nikon had more resolution, if I hadn't uh, down-resed it so that they had the same resolution to be able to make this comparison, you'd probably still be seeing more detail in the Fuji. So if we move over to the, to the bottom right of the image, we can look at the car number plates here. Now this is closer, I would say that there's very little difference, although the lamp there does look a little bit more blurred on the Nikon. If we go up to the top, uh, look at the writing on the back of this crane. The Fuji is probably not quite, no, it's not resolving as much detail as the Nikon. The Nikon, the lettering looks a little bit clearer there. Uh, it's resolving more detail. But if we go over to the top right, Again, this is what I was talking about in terms of significant difference. There's really no significant difference between the two images here. The, the amount of detail that's being resolved is exactly the same or, or to the point that there's no significant difference. So if I were to print these images, I could print the Nikon bigger because it has more resolution. But at a print at about 50 or 60 centimeters, I'm not really gonna see much difference at all. I'm just looking at this uh, lamp here and on the Nikon, it looks a little bit out of focus and it shouldn't be because shoot, there was an F8 and the lamps far, far enough away from the camera to, uh, for it to be sharp front to back. But looking right in the center here, looking at the detail in this bin, uh, again, I would say that the Fuji is, Fuji is resolving uh, more detail than the Nikon. Okay, so now I'm going to have a look at the telephoto. On the left here, you've got the Fuji 55 to 200, and on the right, you've got the Nikon 70 to 200. F4. Now, to get the focal length as, as close as possible, I had to zoom the Nikon in a little bit to about 86 millimeters, which gives the Nikon a little bit of an advantage because generally lenses are, are not quite so sharp at the either end of their, of their focal length. So the Fuji is at the end of its focal length, the Nikon zoomed in a little bit. Now, if we look a little bit in the top left corner, I would say that the Fuji is resolving a little bit more detail, but yeah, there's, yeah, there's not really much difference just going along the bottom into the center. If we look at the cars here on the right side, not much difference. Just looking at the, the stickers on the, on, the, on the side of that air conditioning unit. And now if we look at the street signs, man, Nikon's a little bit sharper there, but I would say no real significant difference, but the lettering is sharper on the Nikon, certainly again on this door frame. Then if we go up to the top, um, yeah, not much difference at all there. If we look at the trees, this is where you can see the kind of worm effect, the smeary effect that you get with the, well, certainly you got with the 16 megapixel Fuji sensor. Uh, there's not anything like as much detail in the Fuji as there is in the Nikon. But remember, this is zoomed into 200 mega, to, into 200%. Uh, if we go down and look at the cars mm, and the sign here, uh, Nikon's a little bit sharper, but there's not really a huge amount in it. Again, I would say there's no real significant difference. 
Now this is the other end of the telephoto lens. It, it zooms all the way in. So again, now the Fuji has the advantage because the Fuji is at about 135 here and the Nikon is at its maximum uh, extension at 200 millimeters. So the Fuji has got an advantage because it's not at the end of its focal range. So again, Fuji on the left, Nikon on the right, uh, looking at these cars in the center of the image. Uh, not a huge amount of detail, uh, not a huge amount of difference, sorry, but I would say the Fuji is resolving a little bit more detail, certainly in the uh, in the paving stones, in the, in the stones in the pavement there, and looking at some of the shape and definition of the cars, it looks to me like the, the Fuji is resolving a little bit more detail. Now, if we move a little bit over to the left, um, so we can have a, have a look at the street light and these railings, uh, you can see that the, the Fuji is resolving considerably more detail there and around the around the cars uh, it looks certainly looks like this the, the fuji is sharper this kind of gets more extreme as we get into the corners the nikon really doesn't perform well and the border and the corner at all if we look at the difference in the street signs it's it's really night and day that is what i would call a significant difference in sharpness the fuji is bringing out a lot more detail if we go across to the bottom right, again, looking at the signs, at the numbers on the wall and the, the, the street name there, there's quite a lot more detail in the, in the Fuji image. And going up to the top right, it's pretty much the same. Now it's worth remembering that that was with a 16 megapixel X-T1. All the new Fuji cameras, the X-Pro2, the X-T2, the X-T20, and the new X-C3 have Fuji's 24 megapixel uh, sensor. Now that's detail and resolution, but there are other characteristics that are important in image quality. Principal among them for landscape shooters is dynamic range. Now the Nikon D800 and probably the new D850, I don't think anyone's reviewed it yet, has incredible dynamic range. That's the range between the darkest shadows and the brightest lights. Now a crop sensor in the Fuji X series, it simply doesn't have as good dynamic range, but it brings us back again to that significant difference. How often do I notice this? How relevant is it for me to overcome all the advantages that I get from Fuji? Certainly the, the size and weight advantages and the feature advantages that I'll talk about a little bit later. Generally, if I'm shooting landscapes, if I'm shooting on the coast, if I'm shooting into a bright light, I'm always going to shoot multiple exposures so I can blend them together or I'll use a graduated neutral density filter. That was the case of the D800 and it's still the case for the X series. In the two years that I've been shooting landscapes with the Fuji X series, there's never been a situation where I've thought, I wish I had more dynamic range here. I simply can't get all the detail in that I want to. I just shoot, to, I just shoot multiple exposures but I was doing that with the Nikon anyway. Now, another aspect of the camera's image quality is its high ISO capability. Now again, the Nikon D800 has fantastic um, high ISO. You can do great star shots with it, but so does the Fuji. So far, for when I've wanted to shoot Astro shots, I've been really happy with the amount of detail that it's got me. I've been very, very happy with the level of noise in the shadows. And certainly, because I don't generally need to, when I'm shooting stars, it's very rare that I need to go past ISO 2600, ISO 3600. That's usually my absolute limit. And the Fuji will handle that pretty much almost as well or without any significant noticeable difference to the Nikon. Now another thing that I get asked a lot about and that certainly needs addressing is the kind of smeary watercolor effect that you got from Fuji RAW files, particularly when you imported them into Adobe Lightroom and particularly with the 16 megapixel sensor in the X-T1 and the X-T10 and the X-E2 and the X-Pro1. Now I certainly did notice it when I looked at the foliage at 100% and compared it with a Nikon camera, but because I don't shoot foliage that often in landscapes, it was never a particular issue with me. But even then, with some of these images like this one where there's a lot of foliage it was never it was never something that i felt had a significant impact on the image or reduced the quality in any way so i was quite happy to live with it now with the xt2 there doesn't seem to be a problem i don't know if that's because fuji have changed the sensor or if adobe lightroom have improved the way that they read fuji raw files but i have to say it's not something that i noticed with the new camera but being honest that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not there Generally, with photography, as in all things, we have a capacity to ignore things that we don't want to see, or alternatively, we see things and amplify things that we do want to see. So if you kind of decided that you hate this watercolor effect, if you look for it and you see it, you're going to notice it and it's going to be a problem for you. However, I'm, I'm perhaps guilty of this, if you already love the Fuji camera system, if, you are, if you're happy with the image quality, you're probably quite capable of overlooking them or of overlooking issues like that, or of not seeing it or of telling yourself that it's not there. 
what's the reality? Uh, it's very hard because very few people judge with completely objective eyes. But what that means to me is that the issue isn't something that's so significant that for the terms of my output, and I know I'm repeating myself again, and for the purposes that I use the camera for the prints that I, that I do, I simply don't notice it and it's not a problem. But you have to decide for yourself. You have to look at the images and say, can I live with this? Is this okay? For me, I certainly can. It's not an issue. It's not something I notice. It's not something that I see in my images and I'm perfectly happy with the images that the Fuji has given me. However, if it is something that you find noticeable or off-putting, you can always try using a different RAW processor like uh, Capture One or Irident Developer, which works particularly well with Fuji RAW files. It's easy to fit Irident Developer into your Lightroom workflow. You just simply import the images into Lightroom and then you right click open image in Irident Developer. So the raw image will then open in Irident and that will give you your raw conversion. And then you just save it back into Lightroom as a DNG or a TIFF. And the raw, the raw conversions have been done elsewhere and you'll get the best raw conversion that you can for a Fuji raw file. It does add about 30 seconds to a minute on your, on your workflow for each image and it's not something that I genuinely find necessary. I suppose if I was shooting lots of foliage then I might use it a little bit more, but it is an option that's there if you really feel the need to use it. So looking at the image quality overall, the Nikon does have more resolution, but it doesn't necessarily have more detail with the lenses that I'm using. It has slightly higher dynamic range and possibly slightly better high ISO performance, but it is a difference significant, which brings me back to what I was saying before about a significant difference and how noticeable it is in the work and in the output that you've got. And quite simply, for magazine prints, for these kind of prints that I'm providing for clients, there is no significant difference to my eyes. Now you may disagree with me and that's fine. Everything is subjective. Everyone has their own opinion and people tend to see things or not see things depending on a lot of their emotional preferences anyway. But for me, for this work that I'm doing, I'm perfectly happy using a crop sensor, 24 megapixel Fuji, certainly as happy as I was with a Nikon D800. So then we have to look at the advantage of using a mirrorless system. Now I've already talked a lot about size and weight, which is a huge difference for me. But one of the things that I really liked about Fuji was the, the way that they implemented all their features. So things like the tiltable screen, which uh, at the time you didn't simply didn't have on the Nikon is something that I use a huge amount for landscape photography because I've quite often got the camera very close to the ground. So being able to look down on the screen was a big deal for me. Now another thing that I love is the EVF. I found that I much prefer using an EVF to an optical viewfinder. It's brighter. It shows me exactly what the exposure of the image is going to look like before I click the shutter. I've got the histogram on there. I get immediate feedback when I change the exposure compensation. So it, it kind of does make you a little bit lazy because you know exactly what the image is going to look like before you even click the shutter and quite honestly I don't think I could go back to using an optical viewfinder now again that's a preference thing a lot of people prefer optical viewfinders and I get that but for me the EVF is so good and it's something that I do much prefer on mirrorless cameras now as I said before I like the tactile nature of the buttons I like having the ISO shutter speed uh, exposure compensation on the top where I can see everything I like having the aperture on the lens it makes it a pleasure to use and that's that's something that it's really quite easy to overlook is how much we enjoy using a camera. So since I started using the Fuji, I generally enjoy using it. I enjoy taking pictures with it. I used to find the Nikon, it was an incredibly effective tool, but it wasn't something that I enjoyed carrying. If I was going to go out for a walk around the town, if I was going for a walk with my wife, if I was just going for a short hike, the idea of putting the big Nikon the, with all the lenses in my bag was just something I thought, nah, I'm not going to do, I'm going to leave it home. Now, we're not, maybe not supposed to think of it in that way. The camera is a tool, it's a solid object, we're not supposed to have an emotional connection with it. But it's also worth thinking about is the camera is an extension of your arm, it's an extension of your eye, it's an extension of your body. So the way that you connect with it when you're taking pictures is actually incredibly important. And that's another thing that I've noticed when doing street photography. When I was using the Nikon and the big lenses, there's this huge black object in front of my face and it really separated me when I was traveling, when I was asking people if I could shoot environmental portraits, if I could take pictures of them. With the Fuji, it's a lot smaller and it's a lot less kind of intrusive between me and the subject. Now I found for street photography, it's also a lot more discreet. I get a lot less attention when I'm using this than I ever did with the Nikon. It's not as noticeable, it's a much smaller thing. It's very easy to shoot from the chest with the articulating screen out. It's much easier to capture candids. And generally, it's the kind of thing that when you're walking around a city, people just don't notice it as much. They don't see it as much as they do a big DSLR with a big fat portrait lens on it. 
Now, another thing that's quite important from a landscape point of view is how rugged the camera is. Now, the Nikons, I had them for a long time. I took them to the Sahara Desert. I took them to the Amazon. I used them in the Atacama Desert, South America, to Iceland, to rainy Scotland. And the Nikon cameras always functioned. I never had a single problem with a Nikon camera ever. Now, I haven't been using the Fuji for as long, but so far I can say that they have always functioned perfectly. I've not given, been given any reason to doubt them. Now, I've used them in dusty volcanoes. In Indonesia, I've taken it again to a rainy, snowy Iceland, and next year I'll be taking it to Greenland and also to snowy Norway for the Northern Lights. So far, with the weather-resistant lenses, with the weather-resistant body, the, the Fujis have performed extremely well, and I don't have any problem with them. I don't have any doubts about whether I can take it, whether I can use it in the rain, whether getting wet is going to have any problem with it. They are also incredibly rugged, tough cameras. So I think that's about everything. All I can really say at the end of the day is that from a personal point of view and that from a professional point of view, I haven't regretted switching to Fuji, not for a single second. I really love the image quality that I get from the Fuji cameras. I love the feature set. I greatly appreciate the huge savings in weight and the savings in using a, a much smaller bag. And I genuinely enjoy using the cameras, which for me is a major part of photography, but I appreciate that it's different for everybody. And if there's something that you genuinely hate about the Fuji cameras or something that you love about the camera system that you're using now, then that's fine, stick with that. But if you've got any curiosity, if you're interested in switching to Fuji, then don't hesitate, drop me a comment and I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can or send me an email and I'll reply whenever I've got a minute. But anyway, as always, thanks for watching. I hope it's been useful and take care.